A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering chapter 18 from our Genetics, Essentials, Concepts, and Connections 4th edition textbook. This chapter deals with population and evolutionary genetics, so let's go ahead and get started. So genetic variation, as we've mentioned before in the semester, genetic variation within populations is very important for uh, survival of the species. Remember I said that there's no better way to go extinct than to limit the gene pool and have a limited genetic variability. This is the main reason why during meiosis your your germ cells spend so much uh, energy shuffling those genes around, right? During crossing over, during uh, independent assortment, you have uh, an increase in genetic variability. Remember the odds of producing the same sperm cell twice or the same egg twice with the same genetics is almost uh, almost uh, so so rare it's almost impossible right so genetic variation is vital to success of species and small populations lose genetic variation over time through inbreeding and genetic drift so we're going to talk about what genetic drift is genetic drift is a change in allelic frequency due to sampling error because you have such small populations that you could have drastic changes in allelic frequencies. What does allelic frequency mean? It means the, the frequency of particular alleles like blue eye allele, brown eye allele. You know, if you have a small, small, small population, you might lose, say, the blue eye allele from that population over time, over a couple of generations. But if you have a big population, you know, it's more likely that you will retain the blue eye allele, for instance. And the study of population genetics is really the focus of this chapter. It's the branch of genetics that studies the genetic makeup of groups of individuals and how a group's genetic composition changes over time. So you're looking at Populations, and remember, uh, in genetics, population means a group of the same species. We're not talking about the population of Dallas or the population of Houston. We're talking about population in terms, in biological terms, which means the species, right? So a population of humans versus a population of ladybugs, etc. So again, remember that genetic variation is vitally important for populations. And population evolves through changes in its gene pool. Therefore, population genetics is also a study of evolution. Because evolution, that, that is exactly what evolution is. Evolution refers to genetic change taking place in a group of organisms. You have genetic changes over time. Changes in alleles over time. This is the study of uh, population genetics. This is the study of evolution. So uh, when you look at the human, or, or when you look at populations, uh, the, the best way to describe the alleles among those populations is by the frequency of the genotype that you see in the population. How frequent do you see a genotype? Like big A, big A, big A, little A, little A, little A and also the frequency of alleles in a population. Like what, how many, how much of the, the population possesses the blue eye allele, for instance, or the brown eye allele, for instance. So a frequency is simply a proportion or percentage usually expressed in decimal fraction. Here's an example. For example, 20% of the alleles at a particular locus in a population are big A. So 20% big A. We would say that the frequency of the A allele, the big A allele, is 0.2. You see that it's expressed as a fraction. So if big A were, in, were represented in 100% of a population, if, if everyone in the population had big A allele, 
it would be 1.0 would be the frequency. And if nobody in the population had the big A allele, that would be 0, 0.0. So how do you calculate these frequencies, the gen, uh, genotypic frequency versus the allelic frequency? How do you calculate? Well, for genotypic frequency, it's very simply the number of individuals with the genotype divided by total number. So if you're looking at homozygous dominant for A, right, big A, big A, the F stands for frequency. So the frequency of big A, big A would be simply, very simply, the number of big A, big A individuals in the population divided by the entire number of individuals in the population. Simple as that. Same thing with allelic frequencies, number of copies of a particular allele present in a sample divided by total. So again, the frequency of an allele equals number of copies of the allele divided by number of copies of all alleles at the locus in the population. And if you're, if you're calculating X-linked loci or multiple allele, uh, it's calculated the same way. So let's jump into uh, how you know we can study these populations and study allele changes and dynamics in a population. This leads us to the Hardy-Weinberg law, developed by Godfrey Hardy and Wilhelm Weinberg in 1908. It's essentially a mathematical model that helps us to evaluate the effects of reproduction on the genotypic and allelic frequencies of a population. So exactly what we've been talking about, frequency of uh, genotype, frequency of alleles. Uh, can we study these uh, changes over time in a population? Can we make uh, observations about uh, what's happening uh, ev uh, with evolution and populations? And if there's drift going on where you're losing an allele or is, are alleles being maintained in a population. This is all uh, under the umbrella of this, of this area of study. Now, the Hardy-Weinberg law requires you to make a, ser a series of assumptions and then a couple of predictions. So let's cover some background to the Hardy-Weinberg law. Assumptions, these are the assumptions. You have to assume that the population is large, right? A, a large population. You have to assume that the population is randomly mating. You're not getting a uh, highly selective mating. That there's not uh, mutation going on, a uh, disproportionate amount of mutation going on in the population. You have to assume that there is no migration going on in the population into or out of the population. And you have to assume that no natural selection is going on, like no selective agent is uh, there, like uh, some kind of predator picking off certain members of the population, for instance. If, if all these assumptions are true, are held up, then we can make two predictions. Prediction one, the allelic frequencies, so the frequency of big A or little a or big B or little b, uh, of a population d should not change. The frequency shouldn't change. You shouldn't start getting a whole bunch more per percent of the population with blue eyes, for instance, just out of nowhere. Um, and then prediction number two, the genotypic frequencies should stabilize. So the proportion of people with brown eyes to blue eyes and heterozygotes uh, as well should stabilize. It should be the same percentages over time. Uh, so this here is what they call the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. When genotypes are in the expected proportions, remember, they equalize. This is called Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And in this equation with Hardy-Weinberg, uh, this, this is how, you, this, this is how the, the numbers lay out. You, you have P squared. P squared refers to the homozygous dominant allele pair frequency. So this would be big A, big A, right? So the, the number of big A, big A in the population would be your P squared. Your Q squared represents your recessive allele pair in the, in the population. So this would be your little a, little a, 
And then your 2PQ, this, this represents your heterozygous, your heterozygotes in the population uh, as well. So remember, P square is for homozygous dominant, Q square, homozygous recessive, 2PQ is uh, the uh, heterozygotes. Um, and by the way, where does this come from? It comes from this, remember, when you have a, a heterozygote crossed with a heterozygote, remember this, this is from the monohybrid cross, uh, if, if the frequency of big A is P and the frequency of little a is Q, when you have this cross between heterozygote egg and heterozygote sperm, remember what you have, big A, big A, little a, little a, remember, you know, one to two to one ratio, and then big A, little a twice the time. So th this, essentially, this easy Punnett square, which is your monohybrid cross, is essentially where the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation comes from. Uh, because again, um, one quarter of the time you have big A, big A, so A times A is uh, P squared, right? P squared. Uh, the frequency of big A, big A, remember, that's P squared. Then you have big A, little a's, two, two times, right? Twice, big A, little a, twice. So the frequency of big A, little a, is 2pq, and then your little a, little a, the frequency of little a, little a, is q squared. And that explains where these numbers came from. See, p squared is your homozygous dominance, q squared is your homozygous recessives, and 2pq is your heterozygous in uh, that's that, that easy Punnett square. Okay, so let's do a concept check. Concept check. Which statement is not an assumption of the Hardy-Weinberg law? A. The allelic frequencies P and Q are equal. No, they don't have to be equal. You don't have to have an equal number of blue eyes and brown eyes, for instance. Uh, it just, they equal, they reach equilibrium, but that doesn't mean they are equal. Does that make sense? You can reach equilibrium and have a high number of brown eyes and a low number of blue eyes, but equilibrium means that it that ratio is not changing. Does that make sense? So A is not correct. Why? Because um, uh, these the rest of these should be true. The population is randomly mating. Remember, there's no selective mating. The population is large. Yes, you have to make sure the population is large. Otherwise, the Hardy-Weinberg law does not apply and you're not going to reach equilibrium uh, and natural selection has no effect that's right you want natural selection to not have an effect you don't want some predator coming in and gobbling up all the you know of a certain type of individual in the population all right so with hardy weinberg you can estimate allelic frequencies with the hard hardy weinberg law okay you can estimate so let's look at a concept check that where we can where we can look at where we can calculate using Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. We can calculate uh, you know uh, allelic frequencies or genotypic frequencies in the in the population. So let's look at this this uh, concept and then we'll take a quick break time with Gizmo and Wicked. What do you say? So here it says in cats. All white color is dominant over colors other than all white. So, so all white would be dominant. Okay. In a population of 100 cats, 19 are all white cats. So 19 uh, exhibit the dominant uh, allele, right? They, the dominant phenotype, I should say. So that would be the homozygous dominance. That's your P squared and your heterozygotes, which would be the 2PQ. Assuming that the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equili equilibrium, what is the frequency of all white allele in this population? So what they want to know essentially is your p-value, right? P represents, remember this, so I want you to remember this here. That's why I've, I've broken it down for you. Remember, the frequency of big A, big A, the genotype big A, big A, which would be a white phenotype. Uh, the frequency of the genotype big A, big A is P squared. Remember that from Hardy-Weinberg. The frequency of big A, little a 
is 2pq, and the frequency of little a little a is q2. Um, and sorry, I should have um, made these, um, you know, superscript, you know, so it's p squared, not p2, it's p squared. Now, also remember that uh, the 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 value of p p means the allele big a p represents the allele big a right because if 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 the frequency of a a is p squared then p is a does that make sense p equals one minus q because think about it this way the total number of alleles in the population would be everyone with brown eyes and everyone with blue eyes. Does that make sense? That's a hundred percent, right? If there's no other alleles going on, let's say there's no green eyes or anything like that, or hazel eyes. Let's say there's only people with brown eyes and blue eyes. So what that say is that there's only two alleles in the population. There would be a brown eye allele and a blue eye allele. Um, and so what you would, if you wanted to figure out the number of, 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 uh, uh, white, let's say white fur, right? All white color cat, right? The white allele would be P and that equals one because one represents a hundred percent of the alleles. One minus the 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 number of the allele Q, right? The the decimal fraction of the of the number Q of the allele Q. So if this is true, we can use Hardy Weinberg to figure out this problem. Okay, so if this is true, what does this tell us? So remember that white was dominant and only 19 were dominant, right? Does that make sense? So that means that the number of heterozygotes and the number of homozygous dominants together, these two, these two were your white cats. But what about the, what about the non-white cats, the, the recessive cats? Um, wouldn't that be a hundred minus 19, right? The non-white cats would be a hundred minus 19, and that is what? 81. Does that make sense? So your frequency of non-white cats, your frequency of the homozygous recessive is Q squared equals 81, which means your Q, your Q is 0.9 because your frequency, I'm sorry, instead of 81, it should be 0.81, right? Because remember, these are expressed in decimal form. Your, the number of non-white cats is going to be 81%. So the frequency is 0.81. So if Q squared is 81, or 0.81, then Q is the square root, right? The square root of 0.81, which is 0.9. Does that make sense? 0.9. 0 0.9 is the is your Q. 0 0.9 is your Q. That's the, the 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 frequency. That's the frequency of non-white allele in this population. Does that make sense? So what's your P then? What is the what? Th that's what this question is asking you. Um, what is the frequency of all white allele? So all white allele equals one minus the frequency of the other allele. So one minus 0.9 is 0 0.1. Does that make sense? So the answer would be that the frequency of the all white allele, P, is 0.1 in that population. So you see it's a neat way of utilizing Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium in order to determine the frequency of alleles in that population. As long as you're doing what? You're meeting those assumptions that we made before. The, the population is large, there's no nat uh, natural selection going on, etc. All right, so I hope this makes sense. Uh, let's take a quick break time and we'll be right back. Welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let's go ahead and finish off this chapter. So remember we were talking a little bit about genetic drift and I said this is changes in allele frequency and this 
happens when the population is limited, the population size is limited. And what you need to know is that the when this drift happens, you get a skew towards one allele or the other. Uh, so you, you could end up with too many, uh, a disproportionate amount of the population with big A, for instance, or a disproportionate amount of the population with little a, for instance. Um, and it could skew either way. And what they're saying here is it could skew in an unpredictable way. It could skew towards big A, it could skew towards little a, um, but even though the change is unpredictable, the magnitude of the change is predictable. The magnitude of the genetic drift is higher as the population size decreases. Does that make sense? So genetic drift has a more marked effect as the population size decreases. However, the direction of that change is unpredictable. What are the causes of genetic drift? Small population size, we touched on that. Founder effect, founder effect means when a population is established by a small number of individuals. So let's say there's a new island and somehow some seagulls migrate to that island and decide to live on that island, right? So that would be founder effect. Uh, another example of what causes genetic drift is genetic bottleneck, bottleneck, when a population undergoes a drastic reduction in size. So let's say there is a, a massive fire and that kills off most of uh, some kind of uh, monkeys, right? The monkey population due to a massive fire. And now you have a genetic bottleneck where the surviving 1% of monkeys makes up the population, right? Again, that all of these, uh, the founder effect and the bottleneck effect they, they, they effectively accomplish the same thing, don't they? they? They limit the population size to a small population size. And what are the effects of genetic drift? What, what happens when there is genetic drift? Again, there's a change in allelic frequencies in the population. So again, you could skew towards big A, you could skew towards little a. There's reduced genetic variation because of this and an allele may actually reach a frequency of one or zero, okay? Remember what one means? One means 100% of the population now has big A, or zero, uh, you know, just as easily. Remember the, the direction of the skew is random, but the magnitude is predictable. So, you know, when you limit population size, you could end up with everyone, after a few generations, everyone's big A, or everyone's little a right this is uh, when when everyone becomes one way when everyone becomes big a for instance then you have your the allele frequency reaches one and that allele has uh, is said to have been reached fixation so if an allelic frequency reaches one which means everyone in the population is now of that allele type due to you know usually due to genetic drift uh, this is called fixation, right? Fixation. And then the third effect of genetic drift is that different populations diverge uh, genetically with time. Different populations. So if I were to take, if I were to take a group of seagulls from this island and a group of seagulls to that island, right, to two different islands, and they were to, you know, independently uh, exist, then you could have divergence, genetic divergence between those two different populations. So because of this, look at what it says down here. The first two, see points one and two, effects one and two, the first two take place within a population, while the third example here uh, takes place between populations. So here in this figure, we it's a demonstration of point three here that different populations diverge genetically with time. Here you can see, uh, again, in figure 18.6, this is a computer simulation of changes in the frequency of allele A2, uh, so allele 2, uh, which, which is represented by Q, in five different populations due to random genetic drift. So what, you, what you're looking at here is 
a computer simulation where you've started with a 50-50 even split between allele 2 and allele 1, right? So half the population has allele 1, half the population has allele 2, and after 30, 30 generations, you could end up with a population where you fixed allele 2, so allele 2's frequency has become 1. You could you could just as easily end up with a population where you've lost allele two, allele two and you've fixed allele one, right? So you've fixed allele one, you've lost allele two, and you could have any you know combination of events. You could have any any uh, any any uh, value in between, right? Does that make sense? Again, showing you point three: different populations diverge genetically with time due to genetic drift, due to these small populations. Now moving on, uh, I've mentioned natural selection a few times and we have we may have defined it before but remember this takes place when individuals with adaptive traits produce a greater number of offspring than produced by others in the population. So you have some kind of trait that makes it advantageous for your offspring and you pass that trait on to your offspring, therefore you're gonna increase the number of that trait, you're gonna increase that uh, the allele frequency or trait frequency in the population uh, because of the ad, uh, advantages that that trait possesses. And this, these advantages are in the face of selective agents, factors acting on the population, okay? Uh, and remember, fitness, plays a role in this concept. Fitness is the relative reproductive su success of a genotype. So the higher the fitness, the more you will persist in the face of selective agents and uh, the more the number, the proportion of the population will possess that trait. Here's just a wrap up of what we've been talking about. We've talked about, it. look at figure 18.8. This is mutation migration, genetic drift, and natural selection, remember these, these are the four biggies, have different effects on genetic variation within populations and on genetic divergence between populations. Remember, when you're assuming Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, that the proportions of allele frequencies are not changing in a population, you have to assume mutation is not going on, migration is not going on, genetic drift is not going on due to small population size. Remember, populations are big and natural selection is not going on. But any one of these can have a drastic effect on genetic variation. So take a look here. You either have increased genetic variation versus decreased genetic variation within populations or between populations. And these are the factors that affect increased genetic variation within a population, so that's mutation, migration, and some types of natural selection. The, the factors that decrease genetic variation within populations would include genetic drift and some types of natural selection. The factors that increase genetic variation between populations, this would be mutation, genetic drift, and some types of nat natural selection. And lastly, decreased genetic variation between populations, you've got migration and some types of natural selection. So that's a good wrap up to this chapter. Very interesting stuff. Again, we're looking at populations and allelic frequency changes in populations and the driving factors, the driving factors right here being mutation, migration, genetic drift, and natural selection. And when you Count those out, you've got Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium if you have a large enough population. So pretty interesting stuff and an interesting area of study. But this leads us to the end of this course. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for hanging out with me, Dr. D, as well as your sidekicks, uh, Gizmo and Wicket. It's been fun. I hope you learned a lot and enjoyed the class. Um, and uh, if you have any comments or questions, as always, please leave those in the comment box below, and I will catch you guys next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.
Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D. A Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D. Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D.